On this episode of Translogic, we zap you with an electric shock to your system. A classic conversion hits the streets in Southern California, a few two-wheelers roll through Portland, and a flat-out speed demon delivers thrills in Austin. Welcome to Translogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. A few years ago, getting your old internal combustion car converted to an electric vehicle would have seemed like a daunting, unrealistic task that most likely wasn't even an option. But today, things have changed and we're here to get the lowdown on EV conversions from some of the best in the business. So I'm here with Michael Bream, the owner of EV West, a company which in the last five years has come to be one of the top EV conversion companies in the country. Big five years. Yeah. How yeah, did this all come exciting. about? We were just uh, some hobbyists, just having fun. We wanted to build a race car, the BMW yep. E36 M3. And you put that in the Pikes Peak. Yeah. Like, okay, what's the best race that's, that has an electric class that's been around for a while? And Pikes Peak was the natural fit. It's the second oldest race in America. We actually took it really easy in the car. And when we finally got our time, we couldn't believe that we actually set a record for the uh, street legal electric class. That's incredible. And you beat some pretty stiff competition while you were there. Yeah, you know, talk about beginner's luck, right? We had these guys from Yokohama. We had Monster Tajima. Total heroes to us. And then at the end of the day, we ended up beating them. And I'm, jeez, I get goosebumps just talking <laughs> just about, about yeah. it. You know, the car has been really successful. We've raced the car in some autocross events. You guys have also done a Baja and are looking at doing more races. Yeah, we've done the Mexican 1000. We're the first guys to ever run a sanctioned off-road race in an electric vehicle. We were charging along the path, and we kind of figured that was a little tough. We're going back to the Baja this year. Yep. And and uh, we have a new angle. We're going to take all pre-charged batteries down there and hot swap them. And uh, we hope to be really competitive. And so you've taken the lessons that you've learned building the M3 right, to what right. you guys are doing, which is converting customer cars right. into fully electric street legal vehicles. Right. So when a car comes into the shop, do we just simply open the hood and start pulling things out is that how it begins yeah pretty much drop the motor i mean it's messy you know yep. it requires a lot of mopping on the shop floor and stuff right. afterwards and we try and get that done just get it out if you kind of look at it you know in a broad scope the, the whole process is fairly simple but the devil is in the details right the aesthetics and the making it really safe and really reliable i think that's what we excel at when you take out things like the gas tank radiator drivetrain right. uh, and the engine right replace it with a battery pack and an electric motor which right. is generally smaller do you end up with extra space within the vehicle? Yeah, it works out about the same right, right now and the weight of the components right now we usually add maybe 100 200 pounds to the overall weight of the vehicle okay. uh, but that's changing just in the five years that we've been in this we've seen our battery density get a lot better yeah. and so you know now we're getting more range and we're putting less uh, weight into the car what type of battery are you leaning towards more when it comes to well all of the lithium ion chemistries and it's a real promising time i mean uh you know there's so many uh battery breakthroughs you know mit all these guys are working on some really great stuff is there cars that you see that have come in where you're like, oh, I really don't feel like massacring this car right now because it's such a beauty? Yeah, yeah. We had an NFL guy come in. He wanted to do a 458, and we just told him there's no, yeah, right, same reaction. Yeah. <laughs> I can't touch a flat crank V12, right? Sorry about that, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> it's good the way yeah, it is. Yeah. As new parts become available, as technology improves, is there possibilities to come back in, swap over components? Seeing the advancements in battery technology, this is something you might uh, do a conversion now and then maybe 10 years down the road, put a battery pack in there that's a quarter the size and maybe three times the range, right? And you're going to improve the performance of the car because you're going to make the car lighter and more powerful at the same time. Yeah. In the garage right now, we've got the Ferrari 308. Ferrari there, Jeep. Uh, Jeep. 69 Carmen Ghia. We got an 80 Spider. Uh, we got the M3. We got a 57 bus out there. We got a 58 Ragtop, a 65 912, a 7302. I can keep going. Yeah. So I'm going to be going in the Carmen Ghia, am I? Yeah. Yep. Super excited yep. to have a drive in these because I've driven many electric cars, but I've never driven one that's yep. got such a classic look. What Michael's done with this car is essentially take a 1969 Carmen Ghia, remove the powertrain, traditional combustion engine, replace it with batteries and an electric motor. <laughs> probably wondering why I'm driving this old car quite like this. Well, it's because Michael in particular asked me to drive it this way to show how capable a car that's this old can be without anything going wrong. Electric engines are just so reliable 
that you can absolutely beat on them and nothing untoward is going to happen. And so far, I think he's right. So just like in a regular car, you have to change the gears if you want the torque. Like first will give you more torque, then second, then third. But you can, if you're sitting in traffic, just take off in third and it's not going to do any damage at all. It's just not going to give you the punch that take off in first will give you. And with an electric engine, you've got no worries about this thing blowing up. You can literally put it into neutral, like I'm going to do now, hold the pedal flat to the floor. And if you can hear that, that's 6,500 RPM. It will never go beyond that. It will never blow a piston, it will never explode. We're not doing this really so much because we're, we're the hardcore environmentalists or we're trying to save the earth. We're doing this because it's horsepower. I mean, I got a car out there that can produce, you know, almost 900 foot pounds of torque instantly. Like if we can't at least double your torque and horsepower, we won't touch the car. Specs wise, it's got 120 foot pounds of torque. It's got about 100 horsepower and it's got a top speed of over 100 miles an hour. The conversion itself, $30,000. So it's not entirely for everybody, but if you've got a classic car like this that you want to drive around as a daily driver without any real worries of the thing falling apart or blowing up or dumping a bunch of money into it weekend after weekend, then, you know, this could be a solution for you. We got these cars like this, you know, a 50 plus year old car. Yeah. Uh, I think we can both agree we want to see this car still rolling around 50 years from Absolutely. now. And there's probably a better chance of that on electric than there is on the yeah. combustion. Traditionally, yeah. Yeah. The world's changing, right? Like, yeah. and we can't control it. You and I have no control over it. We can just make it fun along the way. So, maybe it's not such a crazy idea after all to take the old pet project and turn it into an electric vehicle for the 21st century. And while it's still kind of expensive, we're hoping those prices will lower over time because we'd love to see this be an option for everyone. A little later, the Zombie 222 will get the blood pumping. But first, Works Electric shows off their two-wheeled EVs. Just exploring downtown Portland on my Rover. Autoblog, the ultimate automotive resource. From the latest vehicle reviews, shopping advice, and ownership tips, to helpful apps, community forums, and photo sharing. Autoblog, where you can research, shop, and share everything on wheels. Let's face it, some of our favorite childhood memories is zooming down a hill on a scooter with a big smile on our face. But unfortunately, we grow out of them and we have to hang them up. That is, though, until you find a scooter that does 35 miles an hour. Exploring downtown Portland on my rover. Hook branch. Finally on board the Works Electric Rover. This is the BR version. And because it's got these massive fat wide tires, it's super stable. Here in Portland, there's a lot of things like uh, tram tracks and things like that. You just ride straight over. It doesn't get you all squirrely or anything. Super easy. As soon as you get on, it feels exactly like you imagine a scooter should feel like. Everybody's having a look going, oh my God, that looks like so much fun. So Brad Baker is CEO and the founder of Works Electric. We're here obviously to find out about the Rover. I liken it to if Mad Max owned a scooter, this would be the scooter he owns. <laughs> this thing's a real weapon, isn't it? I have never heard of it being called a weapon before. <laughs> but, uh, this all uh, came about, didn't it? Because your wife has a massive hill that she needs to get up to to go to work and you were like, well, got to keep the wife happy. <laughs> <laughs> she had this commute, which is it's like a mile away from where we lived but it'd take her 45 minutes to get up there every yeah. day. It's like, can we make something that I can just drive up there and just bring into the office with me, you know? And so it's like, well, it's kind of a good idea. That is how it started. And she was kind of my hardcore beta tester. So there's two models. We've got the standard and the BR. It's all electric. And the charge takes around five hours and we can also fast charge it in right around an hour. Uh, the vehicle can go 35 miles an hour. It's constructed entirely of aircraft grade aluminum. Highest power to weight ratio, any vehicle out there, at least in that space. So if, for instance, say I had a truck and I was heading into work and I didn't want to drive all the way into town, could I feasibly pick this up, throw it in the back of the truck 
and get it out when it's time and ride the last 10 yeah. miles into work. And that's really like the whole point. And then you have the optional add-on, which is the seat as well. For those who are really just want to take it easy, you can actually sit down on the thing as well rather yeah, than stand up. For exactly. It does solve what I like to call the urban dilemma, yep. you know, which is you live downtown, you work downtown, and parking space for a car costs you two, three hundred bucks a month. If you're heading into work and you're thinking, you know what, I want to deal with traffic, I don't want to drive all the way in and try and find a park. You just leave your car 10 miles away from work, have a blast cruising into the city on your Rover, getting there way faster, and then just carry it up into the office with you if you like. 35 miles an hour, I mean, you're keeping up with traffic at that point, if you're, yeah. you know, as long as you're not on the freeway, I mean, you're doing traffic speeds. I mean, that's no slouch. Full disclosure, 35 miles an hour with this vehicle on the street, not legal. Okay. Anywhere. If you bring the top speed down to 24 miles an hour, the vehicle is legal everywhere. You yep. can drive it in bicycle lanes, you can take it on bicycle trails, you can drive on the shoulder of the road. You don't need insurance, you don't need registration, you don't need license plates. There's a lot of potential markets. Can we go off road on it as well? Yes, you can. You know, you're not gonna take this down the side of a mountain, but fire roads, gravel roads, things like that, it's awesome. All right, so I'm just taking it on the dirt now. It's a little bit bumpy. Just want to see how it holds up. The vehicle itself is all weather capable. You know, it can go rain, snow, you name it. The vehicle itself is going to be fine. Yeah, it's not for doing jumps on a supercross track, that's for certain. But if you need to go down a driveway or a dirt track somewhere, totally fine. Well, you're a busy man, not only with the Rovers, but You've got another project that you've been working on as well, and we're standing in front of it right now. The electric chopper, What? how did this come about? So it began with me just wanting my own electric motorcycle. The vehicle itself, that my kind of my baseline offering, a top speed of right around 100 miles an hour, right around 80 foot-pounds of torque, yep. and it'll have a range of 60 miles. And then from there, we can go very high, upwards of 140 miles an hour into that 100 mile range yeah. territory, you know, close to 150, 200 foot pounds of torque. Serious, That's serious, serious stuff. torque. Normally, when you ride an electric motorcycle, you expect it to be completely silent. It's chain driven, so you've got this constant metallic whine beside you. How do you feel about the electric motorcycles now? I mean, there's offerings from, you know, lots of companies, Zero, Bramo, even Harley Davidson with their new yeah. live wire. Where do you see the future of electric bikes going? It's absolutely the future. In my mind, at least, the real tipping point is gonna be when they start performing better than the gassers. And they're going to. Whoa. Oh, that was a big bump. Kinda looks like something out of the movies. It's almost... DeLorean-esque with its aluminum body shells and metal tubing running around. Have you got many customers for the choppers right now? I'm very particular. And so it really takes a very special person to get moving on a custom build. Yeah. Uh, so it just has to be somebody very passionate about it. But when it does, absolutely. This is a bike that just goes to show what you can do in your own backyard if you've got the brains to do it. Brad's built this thing by hand and yeah. We've had a wonderful day here in Portland playing with some toys from a company that seems like they're out to change a few perceptions. One, that the scooter isn't just for kids and it can actually be a viable means of transportation. And two, that choppers don't have to be the obnoxiously loud conversation killers that they once were. And they've done them both in stylish, fun and quality packages. Up next, Bloodshed Motors unleashes the Zombie 222. This car was designed with one thing and one thing only, and that is sheer speed. This show has seen its fair share of electric vehicles. From homemade rides to top of the line Teslas, EVs are a Translogic staple. But we may have found one to rule them all, performance wise at least. And that's why we're down here in Austin to bring the heat. The Texas heat with the Zombie 222. Oh my 
gosh. What have I gone and got myself into? <laughs> First off, straight out of the gate, the 68 Fastback is one of my favourite classic cars. Something about old school American muscle just really gets my blood pumping. But then when you take two electric motors in this case at it, producing 1,800 foot-pounds of torque with 800 horsepower and you've got something really, really special. But obviously, when you're in a muscle car, what you're going to want to do is test to see if it can do a burnout. Here we go <laughs> with the world's quietest burnout. Here we go <laughs> with the world's quietest burnout. <laughs> oh, and it's still going. Oh, this thing just wants to spin and spin and spin. So I'm here with Mitch Medford in the bloodshed, the place where, I guess, the birthplace of the Zombie 222, which was yeah. your brainchild. Where did it come from? So I just went and Googled the words electric dragster, and up came this little car called the White Zombie, which yeah. is a 1972 Datsun 1200. It could do zero to 60 in 1.8 seconds. From that second, I couldn't get the image out of my head of taking a bigger version of what had been done to that little Datsun and putting it in the coolest, most iconic of American muscle yeah. cars. Mustangs, they're good cars for this because they're small and lightweight, yep. and, and let's face it, there's nothing more iconic globally than a 67, 68 Mustang yep. fastback. Did you have a goal in mind when you started work on the project? I wanted to start a company that would do nothing but specialize in converting vintage, iconic cars into supercars. We have to take Detroit metal yep. and leave the fenders, leave the glass. We can't cheat. We're not going to make a drag car, right? And it's got to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with supercars and actually outrun them. By the looks of things, it seems that you've <coughs> achieved your goal. I mean, I, I can see you've got a piece of paper in your hands there, and you're dying to show it to me. <laughs> this is a series of numbers that you achieved at the drag strip. Let's start with your zero to 60 time. The zero to 60 time is now 1.94 seconds. This car is quicker okay. off the line than every, every production supercar in the world. But you've also got some other impressive numbers as well, because you ended the Texas mile. 174.2 miles an hour in a street electric car. The wow. previous record had been 155 miles an hour. Yep. It didn't take but an hour. And yep. I started getting emails going, 200, you gotta go for 200. Um, we're actually kicking off a Kickstarter right now to try to raise uh, a little bit extra money to help get the car ready for the 200 mile an hour attempt. This car was designed with one thing and one thing only, and that is sheer speed. A zero to 60 time, of 1.94 seconds. To put that into perspective, that means that it's technically faster, zero to 60, than a Porsche 918, than a Bugatti Veyron, than a Ferrari La Ferrari. These are million dollar cars. You've gone with a pretty unique configuration, two motors mm -hmm. and 1.1 megawatts of power. The battery, yes. The motors and the controllers are capable of doing so much, you have to have a battery pack that can feed those systems. Yep, 800 horsepower, yep. but it's the torque figure that really got me. 1,800 foot-pounds of torque. Yeah. How are you getting that much power? Well, I use DC motors. Very briefly, AC motors are a lot more like turbocharged four-cylinder motors that can rev very, very high, but they don't have as much low-end torque. DC motors are much more like a 1,200 cubic inch V8. They're torque monsters, but you can't rev them very high. So what we decided to do was to keep that unbelievable torque and get me top speed so I can prove to the world that it's not just a quick car, but it's a fast car. Yeah. I use overdrive units you will get up to a certain speed, say 70, 80 miles an hour, you'll throw into one overdrive, and the car literally will throw you back into the seat again because it's dropped the RPMs way down, yep. and it goes, oh, hello, I've got 1,800 foot-pounds of torque again. again. Let's test the gear vector, shall we? Accelerate. And second, oh, wow! <laughs> Well, I think one thing that you guys are doing is that you're, you're, you're taking something which 
is good for the environment, but you're also showing you can be good for the environment and faster. I've noticed most of the haters come from people who read magazines or just read about things yeah. and have opinions. If you go to a track where a guy has spent hours and hours and a thousand dollars trying to make a car run faster and faster down the track, you know what these guys care about? Speed. Then they go, how much does it cost? <laughs> and speaking of cost, <clears throat> how much does it cost? If you take a vintage car like any one of these Mustangs sitting here and you want it to perform at the level of the 222, which is supercar territory, it's approximately $125,000. Yep. And that's everything, meaning you bring the car and then we do all new suspension, frame reinforcements, the electric drivetrain, battery installations, all the wiring and everything. Having driven the amount of cars that I get to drive in this show, and this car has really taken the cake as far as sheer numbers, horsepower, excitement, and just seat of the pants acceleration. I think we're getting 40 to 50 miles range. It seems silly to talk about range in a car like this because it's not designed for range. This is designed for getting 174 mile an hour top speeds and beyond. You're the only the second non-Bloodshed Motors member to ever drive wow. this car. And okay, I, well, but I, I want you to enjoy it. Tear I'm it up, man. I'm very privileged. I, I, and once the Zombie 222 hits the Magic 200, is there another project? The Zombie 222 has been breaking electric records. Yep. Now it's time to break records, gas or electric. There are very few cars that I've driven that have left me as unsettled in a good way as the Zombie 222. It's so raw and so powerful that it almost verges on madness. That being said though, if this is the future of EVs, then we're looking at a bright and beautiful future. For Translogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. We'll catch you next time.